welcome to the real start of uh, the subject. Um, what we're going to discuss in this first lecture is um, what is policy, some definitions of policy, um, how you would visualize policy. Uh, often we will think of policy as following a cycle or is it maybe a square or maybe it's something else. Um, and I will discuss policy logic and policy theory, um, which is not the same as political theory, which you will encounter in a next lecture. So what is policy? Is it a document, a report on um, an, an issue in society, on a social problem? Is, it, is policy an election promise? Um, Labour saying we will give five million toward a hospital uh, in Bandura. Is that policy? Is the statement of values and commitments, we believe in equity in society, is that policy? Are the budget papers policy? Is it any decision or action taken by those with responsibility in an area? Maybe media statements. Uh, someone goes on television, a minister, and he says, we will stop the boat. Is that policy? Or is policy about unspoken rules and underlying culture about how business is done in this place, locally, statewide, nationally? What is policy? Well, here's a, a, an overview um, of some of the uh, some of the approaches to policy. Um, Cochrane says that policy is the actions of government and the intentions that determine those actions. Um, and, and a, a few lines down, Dai, in the same Birkeland publication, says, well, it's whatever governments choose to do or not to do. Um, even to consciously not do something is a policy decision. Richards and Smith say policy is a general term used to describe a formal decision or plan of action adopted by an actor to achieve a particular goal. Public policy is a more specific term applied to a formal decision or a plan of action that has been taken by or has involved a state organization. And uh, we will mostly focus on public policy in this subject, but occasionally we will have to touch on organizational policy, on industry policy, because that uh, impacts on the things that, uh, that happen. So if, these, if this is a kind of tentative definition of policy, um, are the following examples policies or health policies? Um, the National Health and Hospital Reform Commission, the Preventative Health Task Force, the Primary Healthcare Strategy Reference Group. Are they policies or expression of policy? Um, are COAG, um, the Council of Australian Governments, National Partnership Payments, is that policy or an expression of policy? Ratifying the Kyoto Protocol on Climate Change, is that a policy? Having a carbon tax or dismissing a carbon tax, is that a policy? Having or abolishing a minister for water, for water and climate change, uh, the Millennium Development Goals at a global level, are they policy? Closing the gap in Aboriginal health in Australia, is that a policy or is that an expression of an ideal, uh, something that we may want to accomplish at some point? Or having a social inclusion board in a, in a local area saying, well, we are in this together and we shouldn't uh, exclude anyone from society. Um, yeah, is this policy? Are these different forms of policy? Are there differences between policy statements, the values that inspire policy, the logic that sits behind policy or policy outputs? Well, those are the things that we will be discussing in this subject. Policy statements typically talk about values and aspirations. For instance, health for all by the year 2000. This is what we believe in. This is what we should be doing. And this was a very strong policy of the World Health Organization toward the end of the 20th century. It's also the values, but also the intent and activities of public agencies. For instance, a policy says that primary health care services in Australia will be coordinated through a community health improvement plan. Policy also reflects values and routine practices, things 
that how we do things in, in our place. Patients requiring urgent care will receive priority treatment and hospitals will be paid on the basis of case mix. Policy statements generally can cover outcomes, processes and inputs. They say something about um, what we want to achieve, the way we want to achieve it and what we need to put into the process in order to achieve it. Is that then clear? Well, look, if you look at the different definitions, um, there's, a, there's a number of things that you would see. Um, a policy is a course of action adopted by an individual group or government or the set of principles on which they are based. That is the core of a policy. For a lot of people, colloquially, policy means the way things should or should be done or are being done uh, around here. And in that way, um, this is similar to a colloquial definition of culture or institution in a sociological uh, sense of, of the word. A, a definition that I like best because it allows for a, a proper policy analysis, and we will go into that um, toward the end of this subject, um, I think should be inscribed on a little tile and put on the wall of anyone who is interested in policy. Policy is the expressed intent to resolve an issue through the allocation of resources in a specified time frame. Um, it says this is the problem, this is how we are going to solve it, and this is when, when we hope to solve it by. There are some issues with defining policy. Um, for instance, public policy, is that whatever governments choose to do and choose not to do? Is that what, what policy should be construed as? Well, we think that health policy is a course of action that affects the set of institution services and funding arrangements in a health system, or that affects health risks and status in the community. Um, and I will come to this a little bit later, because health in itself, of course, is a, is a confusing concept. And um, what we understand to be health policy is un understood by others in very different ways. And we need to be clear about that. Um, does health policy include all policies within the health portfolio or all policies that affect health? And that is, uh, is currently a, a debate um, that a lot of people are engaged in, in, for instance, talking about health in all policies or healthy public policy. So, um, to reiterate this, uh, does, it, does it include health care policy, policies for health improvement? Do we distinguish between system level versus clinical level? Uh, you could have a policy uh, about procedural aspects of patient treatment. Uh, is that something that we want to discuss? Depend, does it depend on the topic? Uh, is health policy about immunization, nutrition, Aboriginal health, or the national registration of health practitioners, um, or private health insurance rebates? Um, these are all issues that we will be discussing uh, in this subject. Um, does public health policy and the way we construct it depend on uh, responsibilities, on morality of, uh, of decision makers? Um, are things like climate change and social inclusion value free and should we just make good policy on them? Does it depend on your definition of public health? Maybe public health is just a set of programs or it, 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 is, it is a vision on the health system as, a, as, a, as an idealist uh, idea about um, how we should structure our lives. Or public health could be seen as a social enterprise, the organized effort by society to protect and promote health and prevent disease and disability, and I'll come back to that. Um, or does it depend on purpose? For instance, is, is public health policy simply to improve the health of the population? Well, in my view, analyzing this, and I wrote about this myself in, uh, in our recent book, the Clavier and, uh, and, and the Leo book, uh, Health Promotion and the Policy Process, this is how we should see public health policy. There's the broader aspect of the broader field or plane um, of health policy. All policies directed toward health. Within that, 
um, there's a particular view of policy making that we call healthy public policy, or these days it's called health in all policies. Healthy public policy says health is made in all sectors of public life, and therefore we should try to make policy in all those different sectors. Two strong areas within that healthy public policy area, apart from the health and all policies where other sectors uh, come in, and I will talk about that in the next slide, is health care policy and public health policy. And one of the things that you should be aware of, I think, is that the way we talk about policy in each of those two areas is very different. The policy elements in public health policy are different from the policy elements in healthcare policy. In public health policy, we talk, or we tend to talk about settings, local level community, uh, risks, smoking, uh, violence, populations, young people, old people, uh, men who have sex with men, uh, or issues, um, safety, security, um, access to, uh, to, to, to immunization services. The policy elements in healthcare policy generally are framed in a rather different way. Healthcare policy tends to talk about resources. What should we mobilize to provide the best care for people? Access of people to that care. Patients or consumers who should have access to care. Um, it, it talks about training and, and the quality of training of doctors, physiotherapists, allied health personnel, and about the operations of um, um, of the healthcare system. So if you look at these things, they are very, very different. Now I said the healthy public policy in itself is a, is a, uh, a complicated issue because when we recognize that any sector in society potentially contributes to health, and we know that from the social determinants on, on health uh, research and, and, and pronouncements, um, how do we do that? Well, we have to combine that with policy on ecosystems, on housing, on social policy, on economic policy. And then we uh, come back to the, the issue of health policy, because then health policy all of a sudden is something that is no longer owned by the health system. Health policy should be something that is owned by society as a whole. And that kind of complicates matters. And uh, I hope that by the end of this subject, you can at least try to make uh, a little bit of sense of the complication when we talk about health policy. And often it is far easier to just talk about um, public health policy alone. And that's why you are studying public health, of course. Cole Batch, one of the, one of the really uh, astute scholars um, in, 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 in the political sciences, says, well, there's a number of things that you always see in policy. Um, there's, there's multiple meanings and uses, multiple makers and users. Um, policies cover different issues made in different arenas, not just in ministries or in parliaments, and they adopt different processes. Uh, between countries, there are different traditions in, in doing this. But all of these things share similar attributes. They talk about authority, Policy means the endorsement by an authoritative decision maker. They talk about expertise. People know about problems and what to do about those problems. And they talk about order. And it needs to be a system. There needs to be consistency in, in, in policy. And that means that you need to consider government, public policy, as well as other institutions, because they interface with government and with, um, with state preferences. So when we look at uh, these uh, attributes one by one, let's first look at authority. The final authority for a policy decision will usually rest with an identifiable person um, in democracies, a government minister or a group, the cabinet, for instance. They take responsibility and can be held accountable um, for that policy. They have to justify why the policy happens or not. And they can be held to account in parliament. Um, there will be officials involved in the process of channeling policy matters to these people, bureaucrats, ministries, advisory councils, etc., etc. 
there will be formal procedures for becoming involved in this process. So um, once you, you, you start making policy there, uh, in many countries is a process of hearing the voice of stakeholders. So these stakeholders could make submissions to select committees. The second area is uh, the second attribute of policy is expertise. This process of developing policy priorities, goals, and, 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 and tools involves the gathering of expertise. And that expertise comes from a pool of experts that includes government officials, academics, business people, lobbyists, and consultants. And the great uh, absent from this little list, of course, is the community. Um, and maybe you want to think about that, what it means that Colbatch does not mention the community as an expert. Um, and there are some experts, for instance, policy analysts, people who make it their daily uh, occupation um, to be more directly involved in the process of shaping policy, thinking about the different options, providing the evidence. Um, and later in the subject, we will actually talk about expertise and evidence and how that is used or not used in, uh, in policy development. The third attribute is order. Policy involves the creation of a shared understanding. You can't make a policy that's only adopted or understood by 5% of the, of the government bureaucracy or of the nation. Uh, you need to have a level of shared understanding. And still, there might be discourse, there might be uh, discontent about uh, policy, but there needs to be a degree of shared understanding. Um, to create that order um, involves dealing with the values of individuals and groups and the perspectives of organizations. It, it is, it's a matter of negotiation. And that's when we talk about evidence um, is often difficult um, because values in society are wildly diverse. Some people hold very different values from others. And uh, therefore, it's important to, uh, to uh, discuss these things. So the interaction may challenge the assumptions and working practices of those concerned. Sometimes you have to find a compromise, to find a middle way in all of this. I already talked about the policy cycle. Um, and the policy cycle was invented by Harold Lasbel. Um, who um, um, I will talk about in my lecture on political thought, was the inventor of political science. He was one of the fathers of political science. And um, he developed a heuristic, a way of looking at problems that made things fairly simple. He said there's a number of stages. These days, the idea of stages in a policy cycle is considered naive. The stages heuristic is too simple a representation of the actual policy process. This is one way of looking at the different stages. Uh, first, you identify a problem, you recognize an issue, you recognize how issues get on the policy agenda, you formulate the policy, you uh, decide on it, the actual creation of the policy, then there is implementation, you just do it, and you evaluate whether um, the policy has worked. Another way of looking at it is you define the problem, you set goals and objectives, you define the different options and strategies. You assess the policy options. Could we do this? Could we do this? What is better? You select and adopt the best policy option. You implement it. And then there's monitoring and evaluation of what, what you're doing. Um, this is a, a, a clear, staged, analytical view of looking at policy. And it, it, it certainly helps. Uh, in looking back on uh, the development of policy, because you will always be able to identify some of these stages. So, is it a cycle? Is it really a cycle? Well, this is a, this is a cycle that I, uh, I developed for the World Health Organization in its work around health in all policies. Um, and these were the different stages or different steps or different elements in the process. You define the problem, you gather information about the problem and uh, you, you funnel your thinking about it. 
you establish the policy theory. What do people believe is cause and effect or intervention and outcome? Or what are the normative aspects um, that, that may impact on, um, uh, on the policy? For instance, uh, under Sharia, um, it, it is perfectly acceptable to have a policy to chop off someone's uh, thieves uh, hand one, once they have stolen. That is a normative aspect that doesn't really uh, hold true here in Australia. So the normative aspect of the policy theory prohibits um, certain ways of dealing with issues. You evaluate the existing policy. Why do we need to make new policy? Why doesn't the old policy work? Do we need to connect with the existing policy? You develop a, a range of alternatives and you test those alternatives with, uh, uh, with stakeholders, with the community, with, uh, with those people involved, and you select the best fit um, to address the problem, but also the best fit to get the shares valued going. You trade off costs and benefits. Sometimes um, you need to invest a lot of effort into solving a very small problem. Well, is it worth it? Um, is that politically acceptable? You matrix um, in, and I will talk about that later. There is a system where you matrix the power of the stakeholders and their support of opposition to, uh, uh, to issues. And um, that it really is a way of seeing whether your policy proposals uh, would be able to survive the adoption process and whether the implementation will be going okay. You describe then how the implementation should happen and you consider the political strategy how to get things adopted. These are some of the questions that you should ask. Now, the red arrow, the red circle in the middle doesn't go clockwise, it goes counterclockwise. And that indicates that often some of these steps happen uh, counterintuitively. They, they happen before you actually follow the step. For instance, in the process of gathering information, you will find that certain implementation strategies have the preference and should be the outcome of the policy process. Um, in evaluating the existing policy, you may already have engaged in trading off the costs and benefits. So all of these things happen at the same time. So when Bridgman and Davis describe the Australian policy cycle uh, as follows, to identify issues, to do a policy analysis, to consider policy instruments, how to lock in policies for implementation, to consult with stakeholders, to coordinate across government portfolios, to make a decision, and then implement things, and finally, of course, evaluate. Yes, this is how technically it should work, but one step may indeed come before the next. We decided when we did our work on health in all policies for the World Health Organization, um, that in fact the policy reality is that it's not a cycle, it is juggling. All of these things happen at the same time. So these are the same steps, um, but they move all the time. Now this looks chaotic, the juggling um, of all these policy elements or policy development elements, it looks chaotic. But remember, in order to be a good juggler, you need to have total discipline. You need to survey completely the field. You need to know exactly where each ball is, because otherwise the whole game would fall down. So chaos, that is policy theory, but you need to organize yourself. Formal government and policy making, I'm not saying that, uh, that uh, ministries uh, in Canberra and, 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 and government agencies are chaotic uh, organizations. There is a formal approach to uh, government and policy making. There is a difference between the legislature, the executive and the judiciary branches of government. It's, it's called the trias politica. Um, and to separate these is a good idea. 
So what is happening in Parliament is not what is happening in uh, the executive branch, the ministries, and is not what is being tested um, by the legal profession. There are different ways of doing this. There are federalist systems like Australia, the United States, Germany, and there are unitary systems that say, no, all of this happens at the same, the same time. And often uh, you will see that there is some kind of mix between federalist and unitary approaches. Some things happen at the state level in Australia, other things happen at the federal level. The Westminster system is uh, um, the system that we have for running our elections, uh, that we have an upper house and a lower house, and that they check each other. They um, secure the full support by the community as uh, represented in upper and lower houses, um, and have a system of checks and balances to see whether policy um, is indeed the wish of the people. So then you have um, parliament, government, cabinet ministers, and the bureaucracy that all work together. There are, um, within the bureaucracy, um, line agencies and central agencies. There are coordination mechanisms at the, at the center. And then there are line agencies that go down um, uh, organizationally to, uh, to implement uh, uh, different aspects uh, of, of a policy. And then there's statutory uh, authorities. For instance, the, environmentally pro the Environmental Protection, Protection Agency is an authority that uh, implements um, and monitors policies on um, the environment and the protection uh, uh, of the environment. And they advise, of course, the other branches of government and, and feed up policy needs to other levels. So, a law is one of the strongest ways of making policy. So what, how does lawmaking in Australia happen? And of course, in, in other countries um, with a Westminster system, um, this lawmaking process is quite similar. In other countries, it, it could happen differently. But legislation is first proposed by ministers or parliamentary committees or through the process of inquiries where um, uh, experts look at an issue and say, well, these things should be um, should be resolved through a piece of legislation. Um, the proposal for the law is then refined. There will be a discussion paper. There's public consultation. This is what we're going to do. Do you want to make a submission and express how you feel about this legislation? Then um, at, the, at uh, the state and the federal level, there's cabinet approval. Um, and party approval, because in the Westminster system, you have a single party, usually, that is in charge. Although uh, here in Australia, we have the odd situation where a coalition that is not really a coalition is in charge currently. Um, so parties need to approve of um, the law that is going to be proposed. The bill is introduced. It will be uh, discussed in Parliament. Um, and then uh, once it is, uh, with it, once it is uh, uh, accepted, there is a process that is called royal assent. We are in Australia still part of the British Commonwealth um, and technically uh, the Queen is our monarch. So the Governor General needs to give approval of the law. Um, it's, a, it's a final stage and a final validation. Um, a lot of people would say that it's merely symbolic but it does have uh, its usefulness. If you have a law, that law often also talks about the money, the resources that need to, that need to be allocated to this process. So how does that go? Well, you have a law and then we need to develop proposals how the money is going to be re uh, sourced. Where does it have to come from? Um, how is it going to be spent? Where is it going to be spent? And this happens um, well, up to a year, I would say, in advance of the actual spending of, uh, of the money. Then uh, the Ministry of Health would negotiate with the Departments of Treasury and Finance, so the, the, the guys that, uh, that generate the money and the guys that monitor the money, and they say, well, 
we want this amount of money, it needs to go there. And Treasury and Finance need to see how that fits with the overall economic and financial plan of the nation. When they have given their go-ahead, there is a negotiation within Cabinet. This is the political process, and Cabinet, with different ministers, uh, discuss whether these priorities, this budget allocation plans, um, can find their approval. Then there's a budget announcement. This is what we're doing, and every year there is a time when the budget is officially announced. This is how we're going to spend money. Um, but after that, the budget needs to be discussed in Parliament, and even there, um, it can be tweaked. Uh, we can negotiate uh, and trading off um, how different how different uh, resources are being spent in the policy implementation process. And then ultimately, after um, the budget announcement, up to six months after that, the funds actually flow. So in order to uh, develop and implement policy depends on money, and dedicating the money may take up to two years. Um, and there's a bit of an inconsistency there, because uh, the, the, the normal uh, uh, term of a, of a government in Australia is three years. Um, and if it takes two years to get the money flowing, hmm, you're, you might be in a little bit of, uh, of trouble. Um, and this is one of the critiques that has been voiced on uh, terms of government um, in a country like Australia. But that's, that's something that um, the bureaucracy manages to deal with fairly well. I also want to talk about policy as organized action. So it needs to have coherence. All the bits of the action fit together. It needs to have hierarchy. It needs to say, well, this comes first and then um, others will follow. And it needs to have instrumentality. Um, a, a policy pursues particular pro purposes and solves particular problems. Um, I, will, I will talk about um, uh, implementation later. And these three aspects um, will be addressed in, um, in my talk about implementation of policy. And again, all of these things are subject to negotiation. It's, this is po politics. How do you fit things together? How do you make things cohere? Um, how do you challenge the hierarchy? And what, how do you know that the hierarchy is actually doing what it should be doing? One of the things um, I think that we, that we need to be aware of is, um, is this quote by uh, the famous uh, uh, economist Milton Keynes. Um, he said, there's nothing a government hates more than to be well informed, for it makes the process of arriving at decisions much more complicated and difficult. Um, you need to have wiggle room. That's what he said. Um, to know everything crystal clear uh, prevents the operation of politics. And politics is how we negotiate different values in our systems. So to be well informed, Keynes said, is not a good thing for government. Um, so in the semester, wrapping up, we will look at the following things. We look at domains of inputs to good policy processes, utilizing information and evidence, people management in relation to policy development, how do you negotiate with stakeholders, managing those stakeholder relationships, managing uh, intra-portfolio, cross-portfolio and intergovernmental relationships. It's not just stakeholders outside government, but also within government that need to be brought on board and kept on board. Um, you need to work between policy development and program management. Once the policy is adopted, uh, things haven't ended. You need to be constantly vigilant in, in order to keep developing the outputs of the policy. You need to look at policy evaluation and monitoring, the overall management of the policy process, and leadership. These will be the things that um, that we will be talking about for the remainder of uh, of this semester. When we talk about stakeholders, well, who are those stakeholders? And, and, and imagine um, what kind of stakeholder you would want to be in your future as a public health professional. The decision maker, the bureaucrat, government, uh, a party policy committee, 
independents in the Senate who are not towing the line of one of the bigger parties, staff people, you know, the, 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 the secret intelligence of, uh, um, of, of the decision makers, analysts, NGOs, professional bodies and other advocates. I already mentioned communities as an important stakeholder that's often forgotten in policy processes. Um, and what about industry? Um, a lot of people um, are hesitant or apprehensive to talk about industry interest in policy development, but they do play a very important role. Um, and in public health, we tend to talk of the industry as the medical industrial complex. They have lots of money. They have very good lawyers. They will be able to influence all of this process. Well, everyone is potentially a policy practitioner, practitioner if not a policy maker. So how do we deal with that? At this stage, I'm going to end this lecture with a tentative conclusion. Uh, probably I've raised more questions than I've answered. There are lots of question marks in the different slides. Um, but I hope it stimulates you to start to think about policy as, um, as a problem that we can study systematically, uh, but also recognizing that um, it is fairly chaotic at times, but in juggling it, you need discipline to do it. So, the reality is that we have a lot of mess. There are prescribed ways of doing it. There are formal processes, but then there are political processes. There's informal consultation, there's polling, there's social media aspects. People try to influence the public awareness of things. Um, and we see that policymaking is a continuous iterative process and that there are continuous pressures for change and that you have to trade off which processes and voices matter. So this briefly is the conclusion. And this drives the rest of the semester. We need to understand policy not as officially proclaimed goals and statements. It is also what implicitly happens and how we do things. You need to see policy as a process of continuous negotiation, as well as patterns of everyday practices. I will come to talk about a phenomenon called the street level bureaucrat, people who implement policy, who tweak it to their own purposes. So policy implementation um, may not always follow the lines that have been ideally described. And I will talk about implementation later on. Policy involves evidence and contingency, it, 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 but it also involves argument and political processes, trade-offs, uh, discussions about who gets what. And the evidence needs to be constructed in certain ways. Policy reflects tension between choice for action and structure and context. And um, the bottom line is really from above comes policy and from below comes counter strategy. Whatever you think as a bureaucrat, you should be vigilant that there is a counter move. So I'm coming back to uh, the series of, uh, of lectures. Um, this is the second one, what is policy? Next, we will talk about political, political thought. So what is politics? What are those trade-offs? I will discuss some theory. We'll talk about governance. And I uh, foreshadowed already that we will be talking about evidence, policy instruments, policy anal analysis, and advocacy for policy. What could you do to shape the degrees of freedom, the liberty that you need to pursue the goals that you find important? I hope to see you in the cloud.